All right, is everybody ready to get started? It's 12.30, means it's time to get rolling. So just a reminder, um, some of you are new, newer, some of you are old hat and you've been around forever and you know the drill. <laughs> but we, um, we record every week. And so if you go to discipledojo.org slash podcast, you can find every session we've done going all the way back about five years, plus other sessions that I've done in other places, and it's all available free online. So the reason I say this is because we want to build our subscribers. So maybe you're not a podcaster, fine, but your grandkids are or your son-in-law, or your co-worker who always asks you annoying Bible questions, or any of those people. So, send them that link, discipledojo.org slash podcast. And they can subscribe, and you can say, hey, this is the Bible study I've been going to. If you can't make it in person, uh, we record each week so you can follow along. And it's 30-minute chunks all the way through the books of the Old Testament. And then we have a whole other series on a bunch of other issues. And topics. So we've got a whole end time series. So you know the crazy uncle you have that always sends you emails about what's going on in the Middle East and how so and so is the Antichrist and all that stuff. Well, you can send them a whole podcast with like 10 hours worth of what the Bible actually teaches about the end times and what it doesn't teach. Um, and there's other series on there, Calvinism and Arminianism, and what do we think about that, and um, same-sex ethics and religious freedom, and what do we think about that, and how should we approach it? All kinds of stuff, and it's all available for absolutely free. So hop on there, send that link to other people, get the word out about it. That's a huge, easy way to help this ministry, um, other than becoming a monthly donor. That's a tangible way to help this ministry. But if you do both, then you win the prize for today, a piece of cheesecake. So uh, just know about that. It's, it's kind of an announcement, and, and this Bible study isn't sponsored by anyone other than Ruth's Chris, and they don't really need an announcement since we're here. Uh, but that does need an announcement. So I wanted to let you guys know and encourage you to hop on there and check it out. And if you're a Luddite who's just like, I don't like technology, that's fine. But other people do, and it's a way that people all around the world can hear this podcast. So see the opportunity and take advantage of that. Uh, send it to your pastors, people in your churches, whoever, and say, hey, this is a podcast, just check out. This is what we do every week. And um, maybe they'll learn something, who knows. But we're in Judges. We're in Judges 10 <clears throat> this week. And so last week we saw, we met the Thornbush King, the would-be King of Israel, and how his... Um, his reign was short-lived, and it was violent, and it was uh, pretty terrible. Well, that's the condition of Israel overall. Now we're moving into the third cycle of judges. So there's cycles of major judges throughout the book, and, and they become more ambivalent as the book goes forward. So the first series of judges were all good, the major judges that were named. They actually delivered Israel and did amazing things. Second series of judges... Gideon, eh, okay, he's all right. I mean, he did some good stuff, but he also did some pretty terrible stuff. Now we're going to be moving into, after this brief interlude with the two minor judges, we're going to move into the third section, which is kind of the downhill uh, tumble into disaster full on, where the people haven't learned the lessons from the previous judges. And so before that, though, there's a brief interlude at the beginning of chapter 10, and we learn about two judges. One Kind of sounds like the first series of Judges, and one reminds us a little more of the second series of Judges. So Israel's history is this interweaving of ambiguity throughout the book of Judges. You know, we read this, and we just kind of sometimes think God rubber stamps everything on it as good. And we'll make a you know, cartoon of talking vegetables about it, and teach our kids these stories and everything. But we don't realize, no, God's not rubber stamping everything in this book that's good. This is a raw and an unflinching look at Israel's history. And guess what? Not everything the Bible describes is something that the Bible prescribes. And that's a huge thing to keep in mind. The Bible describes things that it does not endorse. It presents things. Answer it and say, I tell them I said hello. Um, it presents things that it does not approve of. And this is different than if it were just a collection of truths for all time. It's a, it's, the Bible's not that. The Bible is a raw and unflinching look at God's interaction with His people throughout time. So we have to be very careful when people say things like, well, that's the biblical 
blank, you know, the biblical view or the biblical story or the bi- well, the question is, well, which part of the Bible? And and what's the narrator's view of what's being described? And what's God's view of what's being described? Because those things are not always the same. So we really need to keep that in mind, especially as readers of the Old Testament. Otherwise, we end up getting into a position of having defend, to defend things that we shouldn't be defending, such as Gideon's actions in the last chapter, or as we're going to see, Jephthah's actions coming up. So keep that in mind when you're reading, especially the Old Testament. Chapter 10 begins, After the time of Abimelech, a man of Issachar, <clears throat> Tola, son of Pua, the son of Dodo, that's a funny name, Dodo, it actually means his beloved. It's the same root from David, David. Uh, but in English it just sounds like a little fat bird that's extinct. But anyway, after the time of Abimelech, man of Issachar, Tola, son of Pua, son of Dodo, rose to save, there's that word that means to deliver, it's the word Yesha, it's where the name Yeshua, he will deliver, he will save, comes from. So Tola rose to save Israel. He lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He led Israel 23 years, then he died and was buried in Shamir. So a quick, just a, it's a, just a note about this. We don't know anything about Tola except his genealogy and that he arose and he delivered Israel. And then he died. So that's a pretty good legacy. I mean, if that's all you ever know about somebody, they saved an entire people. That's a pretty good legacy. Then his prede- his. Uh, no, his, his follower, the one who comes after him. Verse 3, he was followed by Yair of Gilead, or Jair, but in Hebrew it's J's or Y's, so Yair. Uh, followed by Yair of Gilead, who led Israel 22 years. Now we expect to say he saved Israel, but it doesn't say that, it just says he led Israel 22 years. And now we're going to get a little ambiguous note about him. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. First off, donkeys in the ancient, in this time, we think of donkeys as, I mean, we literally use the word jackass to describe something that's annoying and that's, you know, not worth anything. But donkeys at this time were what you rode if you were nobility, if you were royalty. Donkeys were like, donkeys were like the sedan, you know, like a, like a Porsche in the ancient world. Horses and, and other things, you know, you'd ride camels and horses for utility. They were like SUVs or something. But a donkey was like a refined, you know, like a nice Lexus or something. That's what you, when you think of a donkey. So right off the bat, Yair, it didn't say he delivered Israel. It just said he led Israel. And we've already seen that leading Israel doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. Abimelech led Israel. And Abimelech also, Gideon led Israel. Gideon also had a bunch of sons, and they also rode donkeys. And so we're getting shades of Gideon, and that's kind of an ambiguous mark on this, on Yair's legacy. Um, But 30 sons riding 30 donkeys, first of all, what does that tell us? Well, it does, he wasn't monogamous. No, No woman is having 30 sons, for sure. I mean, even with twins or triplets, that's still like, over the course of life in the ancient world, that's almost impossible. It would be miraculous if one wife. So already we know he's polygamous which is not a good thing in Scripture. Um, and his sons are pampered. They've got wealth. And this is the time when Israel's being oppressed and they're surrounded by enemies. And so they're, they're, the country as a whole is not rich. But Yair is. And his family is. And you see that in Scripture a lot of times. People that are elevated tend to accumulate for themselves rather than leading. The, you know, we don't know anything about Tola or his personal wealth. Because it doesn't matter. His job was to deliver Israel. But Yair, all we know about him is his personal wealth and his nepotism. Because it goes on to say they controlled 30 towns or hamlets in Gilead, which to this day are called Havoth Yair, or villages of Yair. So they, they were controlling. They were, he was creating a little mini dynasty almost. He had his territory and he gave his sons territory. And so they were pampered. They rode on donkeys and they controlled towns. And life was good if you're Yair's family. But we don't know what it was like for Israel. And then when Yair died, he was buried in Kamon. So that's all we get of these two judges. Then, so that should lead us to see the landscape at this time. These are not the golden years of Israel. This is not the idyllic time of Israel. This is a mixed bag in terms of the political and the socioeconomic landscape. Now, verse 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. 
And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served Him, He became angry with them. So Israel's idolatry now is described, and guess what? It's described sevenfold. Seven types of idolatry are listed. And that's not accidental. Because this is showing Israel has gone full-fledged Canaanite. Not only are they, it doesn't say they served the gods of the Sonians, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Canaanites, the God, and Yahweh. No, 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 no. Look at the text. They served the seven gods or sevenfold description of their idolatry of the Canaanite gods and the pagan gods around them, and they abandoned worship of Yahweh. So, not just that they did syncretism, that would have been bad enough, but they did full on conversion and got rid and abandoned and forsook worship of God. That's, that's 100% covenant rebellion. That Deuteronomy spent, we spent a whole year looking at that warning against that in Deuteronomy. So Israel has completely apostatized at this point and become Canaanite. And God becomes very angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. This time two oppressors at the same time. Not just one group coming in and attacking. He sold them in the hands of the Philistines, the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. And literally it says, uh, the first word is the word for to crush, and it's the exact same word that describes what happened to Abimelech's head when the stone fell on it in the last chapter. It's that word. And then the second word is to means to like oppress or to, to afflict. And so Israel is become like Abimelech's head, basically crushed under the weight of the oppressive enemies. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead, the land of the Amorites. This is modern-day Jordan. So this is the Transjordan area. <clears throat> but not just that. The, Amorites, uh, the Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. That's right in the heartland of Israel. That's like Jerusalem Central. And Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. After 18 years, they cry out to God. And God replies, When the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and some versions say Midianites for Maonites, and there's, they could be this, referring to the same people, and you cried to me for help. Did I not save you from their hands? So again, he, he gives them uh, this, this sevenfold, in response to their idolatry, sevenfold act of deliverance. I've delivered you as many times as you've been idolatrous, haven't I? Is what he's saying. Think back to the seven previous people who have afflicted you, enemies that have come against you, and I've delivered you every single time, haven't I? Verse 13, but you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you at the time of your crying out. NIV says when you are in trouble, but it says literally at the time of your crying out. So God says, seven times I've saved you. Seven times you've abandoned me. Guess what? I'm not saving you anymore. Go cry out to these gods you worship. You want to be Canaanite? Act like a Canaanite. Cry out to the gods of the Canaanites and see if they help you. God's had it. He's done. The people are... It's over. So, the Israelites, but the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, as NIV. Literally, it says, do with us like the good in your eyes, or what is good in your eyes, do to us. But please, rescue us now. In Hebrew, it's today. Hayom, rescue us today. So they're crying out again. Yes, we've sinned. They acknowledge their sin. They repent. Verse 16, Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them, and they served the Lord. So now there's repentance. And actual, not just crying out, but actually like doing something about it. Getting rid of the foreign gods action as a result of genuine repentance. Now here's the problem. This next phrase in this verse is very difficult to translate 
in Hebrew into English. And because of that, there are different ways that different translations, which some of you might have, read the next part of this verse. There's one that's come to be kind of the traditional way, and that's a misnomer, but it's a tradition, is what you see if you have an NIV, and it says, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. So in other words, it's like God's moved by their repentance, and now He's going to act. And that is a legit way of reading this text. And if that's true, then this is what you see, is they're crying out for repentance, and God says, your words are empty, I'm not going to listen to you. And then they change their behavior, which is the definition of repentance. It has nothing to do with feeling sorry, it's about changing your behavior. And then when they change, God sees that they're serious and everybody sees this is for real. And then He's moved to save them, moved by compassion. Even after He's renounced them, He goes back, He changes His mind, as other books of the Bible describe situations like this, and decides to be merciful. That's one way of interpreting this verse. And if that's the correct way, then it's a powerful statement that even in the midst of however wrong whatever wrong we've done and however low we've sunk, if there's genuine repentance, not lip service, not go to church one one Sunday after a rough Saturday night and feel good for a week, but actual genuine repentance that means a change in your lifestyle. That's the key. They put away the gods. Not they said, I'm sorry, and let's push the gods to the side. But they put them away. They got rid of them. They threw out the bottle. They threw out the magazines. They threw out whatever it is that they were addicted to pills. They got rid of, they did something that, that, that showed that their words were actually indicative of their heart. And then God was moved by their compassion. And that's what we're going to see in the next chapter. That's one way of reading this verse. However, it's not the only way, because this verse literally, in Hebrew, literally says, they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord, and His soul or life, the word nephesh, it can mean soul, life, inner self, inner being. But it says his soul, his inner being, became short because of Israel's, and then the last word can be translated either effort or misery, toil. So there's an ambiguity. It's literally, it says God's soul became short because of, or on account of, Israel's either effort or toil misery so if it's toil misery and to become short his soul become short means okay it ran out he can he can handle he can put up with it no longer in other words it's referring to the time frame of God's compassion like coming to an, an end then that's the traditional interpretation that God's soul became short meaning he was tired of seeing them afflicted and he could ha- he could bear their misery no longer his patience with seeing their misery is what then runs out. In other words, saying he had compassion on them. So that's one way of interpreting this idiom. But the other way, every other time, this this is the interesting thing about this verse, and every commentator notes this. Every other time that idiom is used, and an idiom is a figure of speech, uh, when we say things like, oh, that came out of left field, right? That's an English phrase. We aren't talking about baseball, but that is literally describing baseball. If something comes out of left field, that means it's unexpected. It's out of nowhere. It's out of... So that's an example of an English idiom. Well, Hebrew has idioms too. And one of those idioms is the soul or life, nephesh, to become short. And every other time that phrase is found that I know of, for instance, in, Samuel six, or in Judges 16.16, 16, Zechariah 11.8, and Numbers 21.4, those are three other times that this idiom is used. Every other time it's used, it means to be annoyed by to be impatient in the sense of, okay, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with this. It's the word used after Samson gets nagged and nagged and nagged by Delilah. And it'll say in chapter 16, his soul, his life became short and he went and told her the secret of his strength. Um, it'll be used to describe people. It'll be used to describe, it was used to describe the people of Israel when they were tired of wandering in the desert and they cried out to God for something besides the manna. They were tired of walking around. Their soul became short. So everywhere else it's used, if this is the exception, which the traditional way of reading it makes this the exception, it is the exception. Because everywhere else, this has the sense of to be annoyed by. If that's the way it should be read, then what this verse is saying is not he could stand their misery any longer, 
but rather he was annoyed by their efforts or their toil. And that then would, show, would argue for them not being sincere about putting their gods away, but rather just trying to do whatever they can to manipulate God to get them out of their misery with no actual genuine turning. So it's an interpretive dilemma here in this passage that, that if you just read one translation, it'll take you one way or the other. But there's a legitimate uh, ambiguity on how you read this. And what makes it more interesting is that in the next section, there's no, and so God delivered them. Or, and so God raised up. The next section is going to go on to describe the rise of Jephthah And it's going to be, for the most part, uh, other than occasional entrances by God into the narrative with His Spirit, for the most part, it's going to be pretty secular and pretty terrible. Now, militarily, there's going to be some victories, but morally, it's going to end in a horrendous story. And so there's ambiguity in this passage. Is is God genuinely moved by their misery and, 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 and going to raise up whatever He's going to raise up to save them? Or... Have they sinned completely sevenfold and are now even beyond redemption to the point where even their effort of putting their gods away annoys God because it's not sincere? Like he talks about later, he says, I hate the noise of your songs, the noise of your festival, your, your festivals are noise in my ears. When the prophets rebuke Israel for maintaining an outward form of religiosity while their lives aren't changed and they're still oppressing the poor and they're still cheating people and they're still lying and sexual immorality and all this stuff. So it's a legitimate toss-up. And I'm not going to tell you which one I think is more correct. It'll just be up to you reading Scripture and you decide and you reason out what you think. But either way, that puts us right into the next section which begins in chapter 11 or, or bridges into chapter 11. So God's reaction, whether He became impatient and annoyed with their false repentance or whether He was genuinely moved by their real repentance, just leave that hanging and, and that ambiguity actually reflects the Hebrew because this is a bit of an ambiguous passage even when literally translated. The reader is left wondering, okay, so what's God going to do? They've rejected Him completely. Sevenfold. So now is He going to deliver them again? Is it going to be a broken record pattern once more? Is He going to be enabling? You know how when somebody continues to do something? Like a spouse who's abusive? And, and every time they come back and, I'm so sorry, it wasn't me. You know how I am when I drink. And then, the, and then two weeks later, they're beating them up again. You, we all know people that have been through that. Some of you have been through that. And, and, they, and there's no change. And so the person continues the pattern. Why? Because there's no reason to change. Because they know every time they do something bad, Every time they lash out in anger, if they just say the right words and put on a show for a few days, then the person will take them back and there's no consequences for their actions. And psychologists call that enabling. And it's something that that pastors and counselors have to get people to see is, yes, you think you're being gracious, but you're actually enabling somebody to continue a destructive path. And for their good and your good, there needs to be a separation. You need to get away. They need to face the consequences of their actions. So this could be a moment like that for Israel where they're going to face the consequences of their actions. And that's going to be up to us in this third cycle of the judges to look at these judges and see what happens and weigh that in our minds. Is that what God's doing here? Or is He coming and graciously offering restoration and repentance and and continuing to extend a hand even to an unrepentant or unchanged people? That's the ambiguity in this last part of the book of Judges. And the whole book is going to end this way, guys. If you're looking, this is the thing, if you're looking for a fairy tale or a fable and a happy ending, you don't get it in Judges. You don't get a moral. It doesn't make for a good 30-minute sitcom or cartoon or Hallmark movie. It ends with more questions than it begins. The book began on a high note. The first judge, the Gentile judge that we saw, Othniel, it's going to end the complete opposite. And we're kind of three quarters of the way down the slide. So, in the last few minutes, <clears throat> bridge in this section, when God's, uh, his soul grew short, whatever you think that means. When the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, Whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of those living in Gilead. 
So this is how the Gileadites, the people in that part, the Transjordan, this is their method for choosing a king, a leader. Whoever is going to launch the attack, whoever runs first into battle, you can be our leader. That's how desperate they are for a leader. Completely against the spirit of Deuteronomy, which said God would choose a king. This is a secular attempt. They are looking for somebody who's going to be big and bad and going to be tough and rule and, and drive out their enemies and make Gilead great again. Interpret that how you will. That's what they're looking for. Somebody who's going to be strong, tough on these bad guys, and, and bring the nation together. And they're going to show it by their military might. That's what the Gileadites, the people of Transjordan, that's what they look for and value in a leader. So, flash to a different scene. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. Yiptak in Hebrew. Yiptak, it means he opens. Uh, we don't know what he opens, but uh, it's, that's literally what the name means. Uh, Yiptak, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead, who was named after the tribe. His mother was a prostitute. So now we have an illegitimate but mighty warrior. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and then when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you're the son of another woman. Just like way back in Genesis when Ishmael was driven away after Isaac was conceived. So you have a man who's got his sons, his family, nice upstanding family in Gilead. He's named after the tribe. And then he has a prostitute that he gets pregnant and she bears him a son. And when that son grows up, his other brothers are like, you're not getting our inheritance. Get out of here. And they drive him away. So you get the sense he would have to have been a mighty warrior. If you grow up that way, you got to learn how to be tough. you got to learn to survive. So Yephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, or literally in the good land. That's Tob just is the Hebrew word for good. Where a group of, and NIV says adventurers, which is silly, because the Hebrew actually says empty men. It's the exact same word that was used to describe the mercenaries that Abimelech, that Gideon hired, no, Abimelech, that Gaal, the guy in the Abimelech story, hired to kill and to assassinate. It's literally empty men, worthless men. NIV, I don't know why, adventurers, that sounds cool, but, but literally, where a group of empty men gathered around him and followed him. So shades of the Abimelech story that we've just seen in the previous chapter are coming up. Illegitimate son, like Abimelech, driven away from his family, not given the full inheritance rights, like Abimelech, gathers around him a group of warlords, like Abimelech, it's the same thing. This, is, this should be familiar to the readers. So this is dark clouds are gathering because we know what happened with Abimelech. Sometime later, so that's his background, sometime later when the Ammonites made war on Israel, so back to the present, the elders of Gilead went to Yiptha in the land of Tob, or the good land. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Yiptha said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? You guys drove me out. I'm, I was too much of an illegitimate. I was, I was too whatever. Oh, but now that I'm a mighty guy, now that I've got some people following me, some ruffians, now that I'm basically a warlord, now you want me to come save you? Verse 8, the elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we're turning to you now. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. You get what you were denied as a kid, which is a standing in the community of your father. So of course, that has appeal to him. Yiptha answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? In other words, do you really mean it? The elders of Gilead replied, and literally they say, Yahweh will be hearing if we do not do as you say. The NIV says, the Lord is our witness, we will certainly do as you say. But literally what they say is, Yahweh, they invoke the name of God. God will be hearing. Active participle. God is listening if we don't do what we say. In other words, you, you bet, they, they, they basically take the name of the Lord. Now whether they take it in vain or not, we'll find out. But they, take, they invoke the name of Yahweh. <clears throat> so, Yiftha went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And he spoke all these words before the Lord at Mizpah. 
Uh, and it says he repeated, but, but either way, it's probably a, a suzerain type ceremony. Now they're agreeing you'll be our leader. And so he says, okay. And so they go at Mizpah where the community's gathered, their central headquarters. And he officially, in the presence of Yahweh, is made the leader of these people. Now God is silent in all of this. We don't know his opinion on this yet. But the shades of Abimelech that we see in the story lead us to think this is not going to turn out well. And that's a premonition that's going to hold true pretty much as we move forward. But we are one minute and 30 seconds over. So you're going to have to finish the story or second part of it next week. Have a great week. Come back and we will finish uh, seeing what happens in this stage in Israel's history. Take care, guys.